David was a shepherd boy, and God made him a king. Joseph was a slave, God made him a prime minister. Esther was an orphan, God made her a queen. God doesn't look down on your humble beginning, in fact, he celebrates it. Hello everyone, welcome to or welcome back to 828 with Kate. I'm your host, Kate Taylor, and if you are new here, this podcast is inspired by my belief that every single person has a unique 828 story that God is wanting to write in your life. One where he intricately weaves every aspect of your story together for good, just as he promises in Romans 8.28. This is episode 5 of the podcast, and today I will be sharing 5 biblical principles with you for achieving your dreams. These principles will help take you from just daydreaming about your dream to actually walking in it. But before we get into the episode, I wanted to kind of lay a foundation for this message by sharing some really exciting life news with you all. If you listened to the last episode, you will know that a few years ago, I had to leave a bad relationship. I don't want to keep talking about that relationship because my life has moved on from it. However, due to the ending of that relationship, I had to leave the US and move back to New Zealand to stay with my mum. I had anticipated only being back in New Zealand for a maximum of a few months just to get back on my feet. It has now been a few years. I was, I think, 24, about to turn 25 when I left, and I am 27, about to turn 28 next month. And the majority of my belongings are still in my friend's storage unit in Florida. So what happened is I came back to New Zealand and shortly after my mum got sick. I spent about a year helping her to get better and recovering from the, the shock of going through that whole experience. I then found out that the only visa that I was really eligible for or that would work for my situation now was going to cost 10,000 US dollars. Now, I don't know if that's a lot of money to you, but I had just spent my last $600 on a flight home. I had also stepped away from a traditional job because I felt called to build my ministry. I was still freelancing, but I really had no solid, consistent income. So it has taken a long time, a lot longer than I initially anticipated, and a lot longer than I would have liked. But last week, I officially hit my savings goal to hire the immigration attorney. So the ball is now, hopefully, God willing, the ball is now rolling for me to come back to the States. I would be so grateful if you guys would pray with me for the process. Um, I feel like I'm getting choked up because God has just been so faithful to me, providing for me throughout this process with the opportunities that he has brought the people that I have met along the way, the doors he has opened that I wouldn't be able to open for myself. I really stepped out in faith to pursue this ministry, not knowing how I would also have enough income to to pursue the things that I knew God was putting on my heart, like taking the ministry back to the States. And so 
he really has just been so incredibly faithful in providing. I also don't think I would have been able to access his blessings without these principles that I'm about to share. I believe these five principles are keys to unlock more of God's provision and they will propel you into your purpose if you follow them. So number one, embrace your humble beginning. It does not matter to God where you start out. When he first started putting it on my heart to build my ministry and bring it to the States, I was broke. When God gives you a dream, it will rarely match your budget. He is not checking your bank account, he is checking your faith. You have to stop feeling sorry for yourself, for where you are right now. Stop focusing so much on what you lack. You have to drop the victim mentality. I know that is much easier said than done. I grew up with a single mother. Money has been a huge struggle and strain on my family, even to this day. I still have to work through my feelings of frustration, envy, of wishing that my situation were different. The enemy wants you to believe that where you are right now will prevent you from where you want to go. But do you really think that God is stressed because you have a humble beginning? Do you really think that's going to stop him from doing what he wants to do in your life? David was a shepherd boy, and God made him a king. Joseph was a slave, God made him a prime minister. Esther was an orphan, God made her a queen. God doesn't look down on your humble beginning, in fact, he celebrates it. In Zechariah 4.10, he says, Who dares despise the day of small things? For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. It does not matter to God where you start. It only matters to him that you start and that you start with what you have. There is a story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25 about a man who was going on a journey. Before he leaves, he gathers round his servants and he entrusts each of them with his wealth. It says, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, 
you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him, and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. What Jesus was really communicating in this parable was a picture of himself. He has gone away and he has entrusted us with his resources. Everything that you have and that you think you own, your money, your time, your gifts, your talents, none of that is actually yours. Just FYI. Everything belongs to the Lord your God. The earth and everything in it belong to him. Deuteronomy 10, 14. You might think, well, I worked hard. I went to university, got a good job. I earned this money myself. Deuteronomy 8, 17 says, you might say in your heart, the power and strength of my hands have made this wealth for me. But remember that it is the Lord your God who gives you the power to gain wealth. It's God's money. And just as the servants were given different amounts of wealth according to their ability, God is watching your ability. He needs to see you have discipline with a hundred dollars before he'll give you a thousand. He needs to see how you manage a thousand before he gives you ten thousand. In the story, we aren't told how the servants traded their gold. Maybe they loaned it out at interest or they started a business buying things and then selling it for more money but the point is that by using what they had they created more i would love at some point to do a whole episode on money principles if that's something you guys would be interested in it's something i have really doubled down on the past few years from being in that financial situation and realizing that I grew up not knowing anything about money. So I really have invested in improving my financial literacy because we are not taught in school about taxes or investing or how to budget. So if that's something that you would like me to do at some point, let me know. But this parable in Matthew 25 is not solely about money. It's really about whatever God has given you, are you using it? Are you putting it to work? And maybe you think, well, God hasn't really given me much of anything. I certainly don't have enough money to start a business. What do you have? Don't look at what you don't have. What do you have? When I started this podcast, or when I wanted to start this podcast, I easily could have said, I don't have a camera, I can't film it, I can't do it. But what did God give me? I have an iPhone. So this is being filmed on my iPhone until I can have a camera to film with. Um, This chair I am sitting on, I did not have a pretty aesthetic chair to sit in. So This is an ugly brown recliner chair that someone gave me for free, which I re-upholstered. And by re-upholstered, I mean I cut up a fluffy green blanket and I pinned it over the top because all the chairs that I wanted that looked similar to this were $500, $800, and I couldn't afford that. But be resourceful use what you have because if you are faithful with a few things god will put you in charge of many things jesus was able to feed the crowd of five thousand because of one young boy who was faithful with his five small barley loaves and two small fish once you are faithful with your little god can turn it into a lot steward what you have in the season that you are in then watch how God elevates you. The second principle is to guard your vision. Be careful who you share your dream with. 
before I first moved to the States when I was 23, my stepmom gave me a card and in it she had written to follow my dreams and to watch out for the dream stealers. She said they can come in many forms. Sometimes dream stealers are the people closest to you. Your parents, your best friend, the co-worker you have lunch with every day, maybe even your partner. In fact, I have noticed something since making more entrepreneurial friends or meeting people who have really decided to bet on themselves and double down on achieving their dream. It doesn't matter which industry these dreamers may be in, almost all of them will attest to the fact that when they started pursuing their vision, their loudest supporters were not in their immediate circle. Actually, the people closest to them were the quietest. Their friends, surprisingly, don't buy their products. They don't stream their songs or share them on social media. They don't comment on their videos. Most of their support comes from like-minded dreamers who they meet along the way. I think there's a few reasons for that. Some people are unintentional dream stealers. They genuinely don't realize that their closed-mindedness or pessimism puts a damper on other people. Your dad might think that he's just being a realist when he tells you that artists don't make money and you should be a lawyer instead. He is sowing seeds of doubt in your mind, but he thinks he's giving you wise advice. Then there are the intentional dream stealers. These people are driven by something, usually the spirit of envy. You may not even know that they were envious of you until you share your dream. There is something about sharing what you hope to achieve or your plans for success that can really make some people feel some type of way. In the book of Genesis, Joseph had some brothers who were already jealous of him, but it says when he told them his dream, they hated him all the more. Then Joseph, who was 17 at the time and probably a little foolish or immature, decided to tell them about another dream that he had had. This provoked his brothers to the point of plotting Joseph's death and ultimately selling him into slavery. That's how much envy and hatred it brought up, just by him sharing his dream. Granted, his dream was that he was going to rule over his brothers, so that probably didn't help, but Joseph twice sharing this dream with them probably wasn't the best idea. If you tell someone your dream and they themselves have not found that same courage to pursue whatever is in their heart, it can stir up those feelings of inadequacy or envy. They may think, well, how come you can do that, but I can't? So it's a good idea to keep your dream between you and God, at least in the early days, and at the very least, if you do decide to tell someone, use a lot of discernment before you open up to them. A good example of this is Nehemiah. He was a man who had a dream to rebuild Jerusalem when it was in ruins. He said, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others at night time, and with a select few. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do. Nehemiah understood the value of discernment. When I first found out about the $10,000 figure that I needed to save, I did not tell anyone about it. 
nor did I tell anybody how far away from that amount I was. Because I knew that people, some people in my immediate circle would gasp at that figure and would say something along the lines of, well, how on earth are you going to do that? And that is a thought that I did not need in my head. Because as soon as I had found out that's how much I needed to save, I just decided that it was going to happen. My whole life, I have lived by the motto, where there's a will, there's a way. Now I'm a believer, I know that when I get to the end of my capacity, when I have done all I can do, and there really is no way, there is a God who makes a way. There is a God who will part a sea to make a way. He says, I will even make a way in the wilderness. And I believe that. So when someone tells you that something can't be done, that is a reflection of their limits, not yours and not your God. If they say something is impossible, sure, it's impossible for them because that is the limit of their belief, but you don't need to adopt that as your own. The third principle is that you cannot care about the cringe. When you start anything new, it's going to be cringy. I will cringe at myself when I edit this video, and I have been making content for years now. It has got a lot better, but I still won't watch my videos back once I've edited them. I also heard Dakota Johnson, the actress, say in an interview recently that she won't watch her own movies for the sake of her mental health. That feeling is normal when you are putting yourself out there, having the courage to be seen by others, but the fear of external perception is what holds a lot of people back from even beginning. If you desire to achieve something great, the fact that it's going to be a lot cringy to you at first, and probably a little cringy to others, is just a reality you have to face. Even though Nehemiah had kept his dream to himself, when people eventually found out that he was rebuilding Jerusalem, they mocked and ridiculed him. Anytime you step out and do something bold, innovative, or different, you will receive criticism and judgment. I don't know this for sure, <laughs> I'm just speculating, but I would be willing to bet that at some point my content has been shared in someone's group chat, not in a positive way. Also, the majority of my family are not believers. They might think that my ministry is nuts. <laughs> I don't know what they think of me talking about the enemy or spiritual things on the internet, but I also don't care. I don't spend any time thinking about it, and neither should you. There is a quote I love by Theodore Roosevelt. He said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. It is much better to be the person in the arena, 
than it is to be someone just in the audience judging. And if you are a believer, you should be living just for an audience of one. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1.10, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I don't know about you, but all I care about is reaching the end of my life and hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because the Bible tells us that at the end of our lives, every one of us will stand before God and give an account. When you reach heaven, your parents will not be the ones you are giving an account to. Your best friends will not be waiting at the gates to ask you what you did with your one precious life. There is only one person who you will be accountable to, and it is only his opinion that should matter to you. Now, the fourth principle is don't let time make you doubt what God said. If we go back to Joseph's story, he was 17 years old when he first told his brothers about his dream. And by the time he saw the fulfillment of that dream, he was 30. During that 13-year waiting period, Joseph was either a slave or in prison. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for Joseph to hold on to the hope of what God had told him? Thank God that you are waiting for your dream in the comfort of your own home. But after 13 years, one night, Joseph went to sleep in his prison cell, and the next morning, he was in charge of all of Egypt. Overnight, he went from being a prisoner to a prime minister. God is not fast, but he is sudden. You might pray for your spouse for years and years on end, and in one day, God brings that person into your life and the entire course of your future looks different. You might pitch your business plan or your book for years on end and then in one day someone says yes and your life is changed forever. You might be praying to be a mother and feeling like it's never going to happen but in one night you conceive and in an instant your dream is fulfilled. God is not bound by time, as we are. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Time means nothing to God in the way that it means something to us. We are the ones living in it. God is not. He is outside of time, and yet his timing in our lives is always perfect. C.S. Lewis said, I am sure that God keeps no one waiting, unless he sees that it is good for him to wait. When you do enter your room, you will find that the long wait has done you some kind of good, which you would not have had otherwise. Often when you are waiting, that is God's training period. Which brings me to the fifth and final principle, which is to prepare for what you are praying for. You might be desperate to get to your destination, not realizing that if you get there right now, either it's going to ruin you or you're going to ruin it. If you can't steward what you have in this season, you will lose the thing that you want when you get it. You have to be able to steward your singleness before you can steward the marriage. If you haven't learned how to manage your lust while you're still single, that will wreak havoc on your marriage. If you don't learn to budget while you're making minimum wage, you will bankrupt your business. If you don't work on processing your trauma before you have kids, you are going to create traumatized kids. Proverbs 24:27 says, prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. 
Luke fourteen twenty eight through 30, says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. These verses emphasize the necessity of planning and preparing to ensure that you can successfully complete your goal. I don't know if there are any men listening to this podcast, but if you desire a wife, are you prepared to provide for her? In 1 Timothy Paul addresses the responsibility of a man to provide for his family. He said, If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I see a lot of men these days on social media complaining about having to pay for dinner. And I hate to break it to you, but if you can't afford dinner, you cannot afford a wife. Women are expensive. So if your wife hasn't come along yet, you may be in preparation. And I am not saying you need to make some obscene amount of money. It's more about mindset. You can be a provider man and work in a fast food restaurant. In the same way, you can be a multi-millionaire and actually be really stingy with your money, and have no desire to provide. The point I am making is, imagine if when you find your wife, you are able to say to her, I have been preparing for you. In my mind, in my finances, in my behavior, in my prayer life. As a woman, I can tell you that would be the most attractive masculine thing you could say and from the get-go she is going to see you as a leader because leaders take initiative and for the ladies listening if you desire to be a wife proverbs eighteen twenty two says he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the lord which means you are already a wife when your husband finds you To me, that means you are already upholding godly standards in your life. You are gaining wisdom from scripture. You are working on your trauma. You are cultivating the characteristics of a godly wife so that when your husband finds you, you are prepared. And I am not married yet, so I can only imagine there is so much that can only be learnt within the covenant of marriage, but that doesn't mean we can't be getting ready, right? There is always something we can be doing to prepare for what we are praying for. We shouldn't waste our waiting. That's all I have for you guys today. I hope this episode was helpful. If you enjoyed it, I would love if you would leave a comment on YouTube or you can leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. I have been thinking about maybe doing a Dear Kate segment, maybe at the end of episodes or even doing whole episodes based on questions that you send in or topics you want me to address. If you have anything like that, any questions, you can send them to my email address, which is Kate, C-A-I-T, at 828women.com, or you can send me a DM on the 828women Instagram page. All the questions would be anonymous. I would not read out your name in the episode if you're worried about that. So I look forward to hearing from you guys, and I will talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for watching or listening wherever you're tuning in. Until next time, God bless you guys.